OK, welcome to our Reading Online Sports Economics Seminar. I believe it's the 24th. Um, and we're delighted to have Bert Frick giving his second of these online sports seminars. Um, we've got a uh, uh, autumn schedule now lined up, which includes uh, a few other um, folk who are speaking for the, the second time, uh, following in Bert's footsteps. Um, Bert's going to present today on gender differences in sensation seeking behaviour, empirical evidence evidence from extreme sports. If while you're with us, you're able to keep your microphones muted, um, that's going to be uh, very helpful. Uh, and um, Bert will talk, he's got about an hour in which he's, uh, he's, he's able to talk, uh, and um, then there's uh, enough time to allow us 30 minutes uh, Q&A, should we require it. And there's a chat function which hopefully you can see. Um, and if you can't, feel free to simply park your questions until the end. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, unmute yourselves and ask questions or, um, or simply uh, get me to ask the questions for you. Either way, I'm going to let uh, Bernd start his talk now. Uh, so Bernd, handing over, uh, please do take away your talk. Okay, so I'll try to start my slideshow. Can you see them? Yeah, looks good. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Happy to have you with me on an occasion when the opportunity costs are likely to be high on a Friday afternoon listening to a guy with a strange topic. So it's gender differences in sensation seeking behavior. And I'm looking at two what I consider extreme sports and I will be a bit more specific um, on what I mean by that in a few minutes. So what is the research question? Very simple. Do men and women differ with respect to risk taking and sensation seeking? We do know from um, surveys that have been conducted all over the world that men on average score around five on, a, on an 11 point Likert scale. Do you try to avoid risk? Do you love risk? while women on average score around four. So what I do here is not to compare normal men and women. I, I compare men and women who have self-selected um, far, far to the right on this risk-taking uh, scale. So real-life data is clearly desirable to answer the uh, question I have just asked. But it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to obtain that data. And by obtaining that data, I do not mean survey information, but I would like to look at two extreme sports where people reveal their preferences by self-selecting into a particular environment. So I use data from free diving and cliff diving to test for potential differences in risk taking and sensation seeking uh, between men and women. And I will um, explain the rules of free diving and cliff diving um, in a few minutes. So the data I use here has the advantage that it is truly comparable. That means men and women compete under completely identical rules. Men compete with men and women compete with women. That's important because um, as we know from the literature, women very often shy away from competition when they have to compete against men. So, but here we have two environments with completely identical ru rules <clears throat> where men compete against men and women compete against women. So, there is a large body of literature on risk taking and sensation seeking. Um, here I list only a few of these studies looking at the behavior of men and women in everyday life. So risky behavior has been found to be correlated with higher scores on sensation-seeking scales. Uh, 
Breivik et al. is a representative study of the Norwegian population. Cladellas et al. Um, use a large sample of Spanish uh, college students and they find that sensation-seeking behavior is associated with poorer academic performance. Uh, well, I'm not so sure what is cause and what is effect here, but uh, they only call it an association and they do not talk about causal effects. Crust and Keegan, using two samples of British uh, university students, find that mental toughness is positively correlated with attitudes towards physical risks, but not psychological risks. And as you would have expected by now, some people have also used the uh, Big Five inventory and uh, came up with the result that greater levels of risk taking are associated with higher levels of neuroticism and lower levels of conscientiousness. Um, final um, exa example from the literature here, um, Gamble and Walker, as well as Schmidt et al. have found that the use of bicycle helmets in everyday life is associated with more risky and sensation-seeking behavior. Um, a couple of papers from various sports um, seem to point in, in the same direction. Base jumpers are, have been found to be uh, highly self-directed, persistent and risk-taking, but their stress reactivity is quite heterogeneous. And the stress reactivity uh, has in that particular study been measured by salivary cortisol um, levels before and after the, the jump. Um, another study, a historic study basically, because it was published in 1998 already by Jack and Ronan found that the level of sensation seeking is higher among athletes in high risk than in low risk sports. And you see here on the slide what they consider high-risk sports. It's hang gliding, mountaineering, skydiving, and automobile racing, while golf, swimming, marathon running, and aerobics are considered low-risk sports. Um, Alcan and Akis find that compared to non-athletes, free-diving athletes exhibit higher levels of stress resistance and self-confidence, but, but this is all based on interview studies. So they do not look at actual behavior. Uh, one of the few exceptions from that rule is Barretta et al, who find that the choice of high versus low risk freediving discipline is correlated with sensation seeking behavior. I will explain the differences in the freediving disciplines in a few minutes. Um, moreover, free divers display a significantly lower minimum and maximum heart rate than a matched sample of sedentary individuals and a significantly higher cardiac parasympathetic activity. Well, that's simply due to the uh, special training these uh, people have performed before uh, entering a competition. And as you would expect, younger age, male gender, higher skiing level and helmet usage are all associated with risk-taking behavior among rock climbers and downhill skiers. And there's a large body of literature um, documenting these correlations over and over again. So I completely discard the large body of mostly experimental economics literature on gender difference in risk-taking and competitive orientations due to time and, and space constraints. Um, but to summarize the literature that I've reviewed so far, um, obviously it has so far mainly relied on stated preferences as expressed by interviewees, but usually we are more interested in what people do instead of lit listening to what people uh, tell us. And therefore looking at individual behavior in extreme sports, um, may therefore be an interesting opportunity to better understand the preferences of individuals as they are revealed by their choice of job or leisure time activity. 
a few well sentences on the economics or psychology of sensation seeking of course we all assume that rational utility maximizing individuals constantly compare the expected costs of and the expected returns to the activities they engage in and as soon as the marginal costs exceed the marginal returns the individual withdraws from a particular activity and this means uh, that the utility functions of sensation seekers and non-sensation seekers must be different. Uh, they must be different um, with respect to the appraisal of costs and benefits. So sensation seekers tend to estimate risks as lower and their overall level of anxiety is indeed lower than that of non-sensation seekers. Uh, and at the point where an individual's level of anxiety becomes larger than her sensation seeking, he, she will withdraw from that particular kind of activity. So what then distinguishes sensation seekers from non-sensation seekers? First, uh, among sensation seekers, the anxi anxiety gradient is lower. And second, the sensation seeking curve is shifted to the right compared with low sensation seekers. Uh, this leads to the assumption that high sensation seekers are more likely to enter into risky situations while low sensation seekers are more likely to avoid them. Sensation seeking typically comes with non-monetary rewards and these are perceived as benefits only by high, high sensation seekers for two reasons. First, they may systematically underestimate the risks associated with a particular activity or because they may be willing to accept them. Um, I prefer the latter explanation because high sensation seekers typically prepare very well for the activities they engage in. This means that an underestimation of the risks associated with an activity is not a very plausible explanation for the observable differences in individual behavior. So the first context I want to talk about, or I want to introduce to you is free diving. And these are the three uh, disciplines um, I'm going to look at. So free diving consists of eight disciplines, five of which are open water and three of which are pool disciplines. Um, in the constant weight discipline, the athlete descends and ascends with uh, the help of fins or a monofin and by using his arms to descend. So the athlete is not allowed to touch the rope until he or she has reached the depth that he or she has announced beforehand. Uh, touching the rope while traveling to the announced depth leads to immediate disqualification. And constant weight without fins has the same rules, but the athlete remains unaided by um, a monofin or a pair of fins. In the free immersion discipline, the athlete is allowed to use the rope to descend and to ascend. And therefore, free immersion is considered the most relaxing discipline, while constant weight without fins is considered the most difficult one. There are two further disciplines which are only done as record attempts, but not uh, as a competitive event. In the variable weight discipline, the athlete descends with um, weights either around his waist or standing, sitting on a sled to bring him, her down much faster. And then the athlete has to ascend without any assistance. And in the no limit discipline, um, this looks like a rocket. So this inflatable vest gives the athlete the opportunity to return to the surface much quicker with all the risks associated 
for lung or brain damage. Um, and if you can return much faster, then you can reach a larger depth. And therefore, these two latter disciplines are not competitive events. It's only record um, events. Um, when I talk about extreme sports, I need to mention that a couple of prominent athletes have lost their lives uh, in, in free diving over the last couple of years. Natalia Molchanova from uh, Russia went missing on August 2nd, 2015 on the island of Formentera. She has and continues to be considered the world's greatest freediver. Nicolas Mevoli, an American, died while attempting to set an American record at the vertical blue uh, competition at Dean's Blue Hole in 2013. And Herbert Nitsch, an Austrian, surpassed his own no limit world record with a dive in June 2012 to 253 meters. Try to imagine that. 253 meters below sea level. And when he returned, he was severely disabled due to uh, brain and lung damage, and he has never recovered from that since then. So um, I explained most of, of the rules of free diving already. It's a form of underwater diving that relies on breath holding until resurfacing. Um, athletes do not uh, use a breathing apparatus or a scuba gear. Um, I have mentioned the disciplines and I've outlined the ones that I will use in my empirical analysis. So before jumping into the water, athletes have to announce the depth they want to reach and failure to accomplish the goal leads to either a point deduction in case of minor rule violations or disqualification in case of major rule violation on that particular day of the event. A major rule violation is uh, if the athlete touches the rope before uh, returning or while traveling back to the surface. And the second major rule violation is the athlete loses his conscience after resurfacing. We see that very often people faint once they return. Second context is cliff diving. Um, I find these pictures pretty spectacular, I must admit. Um, so in cliff diving, athletes are required to display their skill and versatility by executing takeoffs from five basic dive groups when leaving a platform that is 27 meters high. I would not even jump from a platform that is five meters high, but OK, people are different. There are three dive three different dive positions and four different dive definitions that can be combined in one way or another during each individual dive. Divers are requested to hand in their four planned dives the day before the first day of competition. Um, and the competition consists of one required dive of a maximum degree of difficulty of 2.8, one immediate intermediate dive with a maximum degree of difficulty of 3.6, and two optional dives uh, assign a degree of difficulty calculated from a specific uh, degree of difficulty formula. It would be far, it would take far too long to explain uh, the calculation um, of these degrees of difficulties in, in more detail here. Um, if you are interested, I can send you uh, the website where this is explained in detail. Uh, the degree of difficulty of each dive is calculated by taking into account the um, difficulty of the execution of each maneuver and the junction of each element of the dive. Takeoff, number of somersaults, number of twists, position during the somersaults, and entry into the water. Um, the total score of each athlete is calculated uh, as follows. Five international jurors judge each dive on three criteria, 
take off position in the air and entry in the water with scores ranging from zero to 10 in half point increments. That's quite similar to ski jumping, for example, or figure skating. So you have a moment of objective performance and you have a moment of subjective evaluation of that performance. The highest and the lowest score are discarded and the remaining three scores are added together. And this sum is then multiplied by the degree of difficulty for each dive and the scores from all four rounds accumulated um, for the final competition result of an Five wild cards to stop. Something has happened to my slideshow, right? You still see it, man. You still see I'm it? I'm seeing though. You froze for a moment now. Well, I cannot see it, but I can return to that. Yeah, you've unshared now, so if you reshare again, slide nine. Okay. Sorry for that. I didn't even touch my computer. You see it again? Yeah. OK. Bye. And the women's competition includes six permanent divers and up to four wild cards per stop too. Wild card divers are usually upcoming athletes that are allowed to compete in only one or two individual events. And finally, points are awarded from first to 14th place in the men's competition and from first to eighth place in the women's competition. The data I use here comes from two different sources. So the free diving data comes from the most prominent annual free diving event on Dean's Blue Hole on the Bahamas, covering the years 2013 to 2018. And you see the website where the data is available. The uh, 2019 event was canceled on short notice. Uh, the event always takes place at the same location. That means you don't have to control for location specific effects in the estimations. And the data for the most prominent series of cliff diving events, the so-called Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series covers the years 2014 to 2019 and is also available um, on the internet. Uh, here, some locations host the event every single year, while other destinations vary over time, and therefore I control for location-specific effects in the estimations. So my, what does my free diving data set look like. I have data on 100 different, 109 different athletes who performed between two and 35 attempts. And that leads to a sample size of 100, oh, 1,103 observations. Um, 37 of the athletes are female and 72 are male. And the dependent variable is um, the result of the competition measured with four different outcome variables, success, point deduction, disqualification, or did not start. And the second dependent variable is um, announced depth versus realized depth. Cliff diving data set includes 66 different athletes who perform, performed between one and 44 jumps yielding a sample size of 876 observations. And of these 66 athletes, 23 are female and 43 are male. And the dependent variable here is the number of points as a measure of the technical difficulty um, of a particular jump. So my hypothesis coming back to the research question, are there any gender differences in risk-taking and sensation-seeking behavior? Uh, the hypothesis is the differences in the performance of men and women have remained constant over time in free diving, while they have decreased in cliff diving. Why that? Well, the lung capacity of women is significantly lower than that of men. So there are physiological 
limits or physical limits um, that deter women from reaching the same depth than men. Uh, in cliff diving, physical abilities are less important. And that means women who have entered the sport later than men will be catching up rapidly. Here you see the uh, descriptive statistics. 61% um, of the free divers are men, 69% of the cliff divers are men. Um, the announced depth of men is 83 meters, minimum 30, maximum 130, and the realized depth is 80, ranging from 3 to 130, so 3 means uh, something happened to the athlete and he had to return to the surface immediately. Announced depth among women is 69, so it's a difference of some 13 meters, and the realized depth is 65, and here again some athletes had to return to the surface rather quickly because something went wrong quite early. And uh, when it, we come to the performance measure in, in cliff diving, the average number of points um, assembled by men is 348, while it is 233 for women. And you see the range is uh, large from 0 to 550 among men and from 0 to 358 among women. When you compare announced and realized depth, um, these figures are quite similar for men and women. The fact that this looks somewhat bimodal has to do with the fact that I here aggregate um, announced and realized depth for the three different disciplines. When you plot uh, the kernel density estimate separately by disciplines, this bimodality disappears completely. So this is simply driven by uh, the differences in, in, perform pof sorry, <clears throat> in performance across the three disciplines. And here you see the uh, outcome in cliff diving events. So there's a much larger spread uh, among men than among women. And when we look at free diving events uh, in terms of outcomes, um, women seem to be more successful than men. So the percentage of successful attempts among women is 65%, among men it's 59. Points deductions are more prevalent, slightly more prevalent among women, while disqualifications um, occur more often in the men's uh, competitions. And between 8 or 9% of the athletes do not appear at the start on a particular day of the event, although they had registered for that day, due to whatever kind of reason. So let's get started with the um, results. What, what you see here is uh, the impact of gender on points in, in cliff diving. Men obtain on average 181 points more than women. What we also see is that the number of points has increased over time, suggesting that um, the technical difficulty of the attempts has increased among men as well as women. And when we interact, uh, the years of the observation period with the gender dummy, we see that women are indeed catching up rapidly. So apart from the interaction of gender and year 2015 and 16, um, the, the remaining three dummies are highly significant and negative, suggesting that the difference between men and women in terms of technical difficulty is decreasing. I control here for um, location as well as for the 
a series number, whether an event is number one or two or three or four in that particular season. So male athletes receive significantly more points than female athletes. Over time, individual attempts get more difficult and are therefore rewarded with more points. And the difference in the points achieved by male and female athletes has decreased considerably over time. Let's turn to uh, the impact of gender on announced and realized depth. Uh, you will see that the difference between announced and realized depth is quite large in terms of number of observations. So the, the starting data set has, as I mentioned already, 1103 observations of which only 672 have been successful. So what you see is that men announce a depth that is 15 meters more than that announced by women, while the realized depth is only about 13 meters more. And as um, expected, the discipline has a considerable impact. So constant weight without fins is associated with 16 meters less compared to the free immersion discipline and constant weight with fins is associated with eight to nine meters uh, more in terms of announced or realized uh, depth. Um, ear dummies seem to suggest that the athlete's performance has increased over the years and here, as expected, the interaction terms of gender and year of competition are all completely insignificant. So women announce 15 meters less than men. In case of success, women reach 13 meters less than men. And finally, the performance of men and women has, has increased equally over time. That means gender difference has remained completely stable. And this, in my view, points to the importance of physical or physiological differences. So when we now look at the impact of gender on performance, in the sense that we distinguish four different outcomes, success, zero, one variable, points deduction, zero, one variable, disqualification, yes, no, or did not start. Uh, a couple of interesting um, facts emerge. First of all, gender has no impact on either of these four potential outcomes. These are four different uh, probit regressions. I also estimated uh, a multinomial logit model and the results are completely identical. So whatever kind of um, estimation strategy you employ, this seems to have no effect whatsoever on the outcome. So when we go further down in the table, the, the larger the announced depth, the less likely is a success and the less likely is a points deduction, but more likely disqualification. And um, in, in the case of constant weight without fins, compared to the free immersion discipline, reduces the, the success probability, reduces the points deduction probability, but significantly increases the probability of a disqualification. And what you can see when we go further down in the table, the longer the competition lasts, the less likely the athletes are to be successful. Um, and when you look at the coefficients of day nine, that's particularly interesting because athletes who had experienced difficulties on the sixth, seventh or eighth day do not show up on the ninth day. And therefore the coefficient for success on day nine is negative, but not statistically significant. So this is clearly a selection issue. Points deduction um, become more likely as the competition progresses. 
So apparently, the first couple of days, the athletes are far fitter than towards the end of the competition. So this must be a pretty exhausting um, sport, and therefore the results are not that surprising, I think. So gender has no impact on any of the four outcome dimensions. Um, announced depth reduces the probability of success and increases the probability of disqualification due to a major rule violation. And the probability of success decreases with the duration of the competition, while the probability of a points deduction and a no-show increases. Uh, in further analyses, I have checked whether the behavior of athletes changes in years immediately following a severe accident or the death of an athlete. And I do not find any changes. Neither men nor women seem to respond uh, to severe accidents or deaths by announcing lower depths, for example. And an individual's success or failure in a previous attempt has no impact on success or failure in the next attempt. So there is no hot hand or cold hand phenomenon to be observed in, in this data. And finally, uh, success or failure of the previous athlete has no impact on success or failure of the following athlete. Um, this is important because in these competitions, at any point in time, there's always one athlete underwater. And the next athlete is allowed to jump into the water only after the previous athlete has returned to the surface. And it may well be that failure um, of your competitor discourages you, but we find no effect whatsoever on previous athletes' performance on next athlete's performance. So summary and implications. Women are underrepresented in extreme sports. Only about one third of the participants in cliff diving and free diving are female. Uh, this is completely in line with the distribution of risk preferences in uh, the general population, as documented, for example, by Thomas Buser in a recent uh, working paper. Uh, however, the percentage of women participating in extreme sports has recently been increasing. The underrepresentation in cliff diving, uh, particularly in the early years, is due to the institutional setup. Now that more and more women are allowed to participate, um, this picture changes. Um, apart from that, men and women who have self-selected into a particular sport seem not to differ significantly in their preferences for sensation-seeking behavior. The performance of women approaches that of men rather quickly in cliff diving, with res I, that means with respect to technical skills and risk attitudes, and the performance of women remains constantly lower in free diving than the performance of men due to differences in physical ability. And this is lung volume. Lung volume of women is about 15% lower than that of men. Um, next steps. Well, I want to um, expand the data set and include other extreme sports like speed skiing or base jumping. And of course, since I consider myself an applied economist, I would like to derive implications for the management of normal profit maximizing firms as well as non-profit organizations. I'll stop here. Thanks again for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and suggestions. Well, thank you, Bert. Really very interesting talk. Uh, the first question really is, um, have you got any field experience in these uh, two particular sports that you've chosen? Um, well, one was suggested to me by a research assistant. 
who uh, is a scuba diver, so diving with an aqualung or something like that. And the second one, well, that was by chance. Um, it, in the years when I taught in, in Salzburg, where the headquarter of Red Bull is located, one of my students came up to me uh, and um, gave a presentation on the commercial activities or on the sponsoring activities of Red Bull. And apart from soccer, um, a couple of strange niche sports are uh, heavily sponsored by Red Bull. And this cliff diving series is one of them. Another one is um, flying in small airplanes, highly risky maneuvers. Uh, that's another uh, thing I would like to look at, but here we have no women at the start line. It's an entirely male um, <laughs> exercise. Uh, I was just wondering if you were a keen free diver or cliff diver. But... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, a bathtub full of water is already a threat for me. <laughs> Key dokey. Well, uh, more serious questions. Uh, Alex has asked um, about whether we're talking also about overconfidence when you're looking at these disqualifications and also the success rate in these uh, diving events. It's difficult to distinguish, to clearly distinguish between overconfidence and risk taking. But um, with respect to disqualifications, or points deductions, there is no difference between men and women. That's the important result for me. Um, so that seems to suggest that overconfidence and um, sensation seeking work in the same direction among men as well as among women. Kido key. key. Um... Alex also asks, and I'll invite Alex to, to follow if he wants to. He also asks if you tried interacting gender with the announced depths. Yeah. Um, clearly, women announce 13 meters less, um, independent of the discipline. So whether it's free immersion or uh, variable weight, variable weight with fins. Um, but that has no effect on the results that I have presented. Hmm. Alex, do you want to follow up any of those? Can't hear you, Alex. No, still can't hear you. No. Nope. Remind me of uh, your talk, Alex, when you couldn't work there. He's going to write. So, but I, I was I, I was interested in the you know, the, the, the overconfidence idea as well, because essentially it's a, it's something of a forecast type evaluation, right? They they forecast these guys forecast how much they're going to mm -hmm. achieve, and then either achieve it or don't achieve it. But there must be a sense of or truncated data issue since. Would you get if they didn't? No, you, you would have if they didn't achieve it as well, right? So they they announce two hundred meters and they get one hundred and eighty-seven meters and then they come back up. Or if they go beyond, do they just carry on as far as they can go, or do they stop at two hundred and come back up? So uh, w when they have to return before they reach the announced depth, they are disqualified. Right. So. If you announce 130 meters and have to return after 129, you have a problem. Um, but coming back to Alex's question with the um, overconfidence issue, I also have in the data the information whether the depth that a particular athlete announces would be a new national record or a new world record. And women are as likely as men to accomplish a new record once they announce it. And I think that goes into the direction of overconfidence more than risk aversion. And here again, no gender difference uh, whatsoever. 
box followed up by writing, did you consider standardising within each gender, given that males and announced in definitely deeper depth? Um, why should I standardise? This means you have to standardize not only by gender, but also by discipline. Um, women engage more in the less stressful um, disciplines than men. So free immersion is considered a relaxing discipline. And here we observe more women than in the um, constant weight without fins, which is considered a particularly difficult issue. So only standardizing by announced depth is therefore a bit difficult. So Alex has followed up. I think he's basically saying that because you've identified that women have uh, a small lung capacity, therefore a meter for a male is not the same as the meter for a female. I will definitely try that and see what happens. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Dennis has sent me a question by email, so let me find that. So yes, um, do announced depths get deeper or shallower as the days into the competition move forward? Can you repeat the question, please? So the day, does the announce, do the announced depths get deeper or shallower as the days into the competition before? So I guess day six, seven, eight, nine, as you have dummies for, does that tell you something about the announced depths? No, the announced depths do not increase over the uh, duration of the event. Mm -hmm. Because most athletes um, compete in all three events. And therefore, they do not show up every single day. But typically, athletes do uh, two dives per event over the course of the nine-day competition. And so they would dive most days then, presumably, but across different competitions? Most likely six out of nine, yeah. Some show up more often, particularly those who have failed to accomplish the announced depth the day before. But they are entirely free to choose the discipline over the days of the competition. So somebody can start with free immersion while somebody else starts with um, variable weight without fins. And they can move between these disciplines anytime. The second question Dennis asks is, is there an advantage for the weight or the height of a diver? No, no, certainly not. Mm. Um, I have no information, unfortunately, not, on, not even on the athlete's uh, age. But after having watched quite some YouTube videos, um, these men and women seem to be quite similar with respect to height and, and weight. Mm. Tim, I've lastly asked, asked a similar question, which is, could you explore uh, effect heterogeneity, uh, for example, by age, by nationality? Um, age is available only for a limited number of the athletes. I have checked mm. everything that you can come up with and, and have found the information for at most one third of the competitors in the two disciplines. And since it's only one third, um, that's not enough because I do not know whether this introduces some kind um, of a bias in the estimations. Um, nationality, I have played around with, with dummies for nationalities, not, only, not for nationalities, but for continents. And these always turned out to be statistically insignificant. Mm. See, these two samples are not that big, 1,100 and 900 observations. So adding 50 country dummies is unlikely to improve the precision of the estimates. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I was quite interested by your um, looking at the ordering of the athletes and your, well, in the sense that you said that uh, the athlete before didn't affect the success of the athlete following. Um, is there any kind of, I mean, is there any kind of ordering of the athletes as they take on these events? Or is it just a, a random ordering or by when they sign up or something like that? Um, I'm not completely sure, and this is difficult to uh, get information on, but I assume that the athletes can choose their slots. So every dive is given a slot of 15 minutes, and then it's the next athlete's um, turn. But who starts early in the morning and who finishes late in the afternoon, I have no idea how this this happens. What I do see in the data is um, most people show up once in the morning, once at around noontime and later in the afternoon. So nobody seems to be specialized on a particular uh, slot on a particular day. And you said that you, something happening, something bad happened, didn't affect uh, anybody else. Um, was it the case that if somebody did really well, the next person would be, you know, encouraged by that and do really well, or was it just that there's no effect whatsoever on either? No, no. No, I would have expected if the athlete who came back to the surface before you go down, if that person faints, um, this will impress you. But apparently. Uh, these guys are all in a tunnel before they go into the water. They do not even recognize what's going on around them. Yeah. And most likely this is helpful if you can concentrate that much on what you're going to do. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Louis, Fury has a hand up for a question. Would you consider uh, trying out as an extreme sport to I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. Would you consider triathlon? No, no, tri- triathlon is clearly not an extreme sport. Even even some uh, special competitions uh, from, from California, very long distances. Uh, well, distance is not hazardous while depth or jumping from a 27 meter platform um, is definitely dangerous. So if you do not enter the water in a complete vertical position as a cliff diver, you will suffer definitely severe injuries. And if you return from a dive too late, you will suffer serious injury. The worst that can happen to you as a long distance triathlete is you fall from your bike, but you will most likely survive without enduring health problems. Ironman is quite a extreme version of a triathlon though, right? I've seen the end of these events and you know, the amount of uh, the area at the end given over to the medical assistance is is substantial. Uh, it's obviously not quite yeah. the same, but... Um, well, I've been a marathon runner myself, a competitive marathon runner, and I've talked to many long-distance triathletes who ran marathons too, and they all argue a marathon is far more exhausting than a long-distance triathlon. And the reason is very simple. You typically run a marathon at your maximum heartbeat for two hours, three hours, four hours. During a long distance triathlon, you never never go over 85% of your maximum heartbeat. And that means, perhaps surprising to many people, long distance triathletes recover rather quickly, um, whereas marathon runners often, often take or need weeks or even months to completely recover. Okay, any more questions or comments?
I'm nothing else by email, and nothing else in the chat window, but if anyone wants to raise their hand, please do feel free to do so. Which case I think we can begin to draw things to a close and we can say uh, thank you very much Bernd, for a really fascinating talk. Uh, the range of sports that we covered in the online sports seminars is now increased by two I think uh, as of today so thank you very much for uh, that amongst the many other contributions today. We return next week. Um, oh Alex is said, oh, Alex, just thanking you Bernd. Um, just checking that wasn't a yeah, follow-up question. Um, we resume next week. Next week we have Dane McCarrick of the University of Leeds presenting on home advantage in the football in the match football matches that resumed uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. Uh, we follow that up the following week with the uh, by Justice Haukat, uh, also on the same topic. So we're going to be looking at football and COVID-19 for the next couple of weeks. Then we move firmly into the autumn schedule. We have Stefan Samansky on the 2nd of October. Uh, Daniel Weimar on the 9th of October uh, and the rest of the uh, seminar schedule for the autumn I will circulate uh, in the next uh, couple of days. So it remains for me to thank uh, all of you for your contributions. Uh, thank Bernd again for uh, his presentation and I look forward to seeing you all next week and I wish you all a fantastic weekend. So I would like to thank everybody for listening, for your questions and wish you a great weekend too.